The Business Innovation Zone, also known as the Biz, is the place to start for entrepreneurs in Iowa. The Biz helps entrepreneurs and startup companies focus on idea development, business models, strategy, market validation, mentoring, and networking. We also help clients connect with qualified community and state resources needed to grow their business. Throughout the year, we provide a number of networking opportunities with experienced entrepreneurs and business leaders by offering monthly luncheons and all-day seminars on marketing and finance. You can learn more about the biz at bizci.org. As Mike said, my name is Andy Snook. Uh, anytime you have any questions, you can find me there, uh, either email or tweet me. I may look at either one of those things more frequently than the other. So what we're going to talk about is uh, the anatomy of a remote sales call. So how many people in here are salespeople? Oh, good. So you guys can help me fix this later. Um, how many people are not salespeople? One. Oh, no, wait, you're wrong. We're all salespeople. <laughs> it would have been funnier if no one would have raised their hand, but you know. So you guys are already following rule number one of my presentations, which is laugh at my stupid jokes, which there'll be several. So what we're going to talk about today, I'll talk a little bit about me as to why I'm standing here, a little bit about the company and how we've done things, and then we'll talk about laying the groundwork for the, for the calls and the sessions, preparing, and then preparing the technology, and then being able to execute. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the president and founder of FastPath. Um, what we do is we sell uh, software to help companies with security, audit, and compliance. So how many people have heard of Sarbanes-Oxley? Right. So we help that the, the dirtiest definition of our company is we help people automate their SOX audits. Um, so we have two clients in the state of Iowa, and the rest are around the world. I'm certified in risk and information systems control, which means that I'm an IT auditor, so I have some expertise around that area. I have 16 years experience in software sales and implementations. As Mike said, uh, in former lives, I used to fill out RFPs, I used to wear a tie, I used to have hair, uh, all sorts of different things. I used to have to get on an airplane at least once a week to go do things. I did a lot of pre-sales for SAP, for Microsoft, and working with sales pe uh, people, uh, and working with prospects, and then also working after the fact uh, through that. Um, that last point up there, how many people know what Microsoft Dynamics is? All right, a couple. How many people knew they were gonna be calisthenics? <laughs> so you guys are doing well. So I don't know what that means, but somebody thinks I'm important somewhere. So a uh, little bit about our company. We were founded in 2004. We're based in Des Moines because I am from Des Moines. So I escaped for a few years to go to college in South Bend. By the way, we're number one. Uh, went, That's not supposed to be funny. <laughs> the, uh, it was the last time we were number one, I was a freshman in college, and it lasted about four days. Uh, so that's how long it's been. I had hair back then as well. Um, based in Des Moines, I uh, went away to school, went to, uh, moved to Boston, moved to Chicago, uh, moved back to West Des Moines. And part of the reason that we're able to have the company that we do in Des Moines is because of technology. <clears throat> so. You know, it's very expensive to fly out of Des Moines. That's my biggest complaint about Des Moines. It's hard to get anywhere. It's extremely expensive. So now that drives up your cost to sale. It, it, does, it drives up your cost of the non-sale, right? So you have issues there. So one of the reasons we, I was able to come back and, and build the company in Des Moines was because you can do things remotely. Um, so we do security and audit software. You can see some of our clients there. You can have quite a fun afternoon with the combination of some of our clients. I'm not sure how Taser fits into that, but some of you are more creative than I am. And then we have the very exciting audit firms, they're crazy. So we have over 600 customers in over 30 countries on six continents. Someday we'll get to Antarctica so I can stop saying six, but we're not there yet. Um, so you can see that for every single one of those countries, I've done a demo for that location. Um, so I just started, my Monday started on Sunday night in Australia this week. So I had a demo at 7 o'clock on Sunday night, which was 10 o'clock in the morning in Australia uh, this week, demoing uh, in, in Australia, SOX is called CLRP9, which sounds like some bad planet in Star Trek. <laughs> Though I won't, I won't admit to watching Star Trek. Some of the movies, not so bad. But. So that just gives you an idea of just from little old West Des Moines, don't ever come there, it's a horrible place to live, right? Please don't come here because it only takes me seven minutes to drive to work. So it's our little secret. So we 
can sell, and we also do all of our implementations remotely as well. So anybody have any questions about what we do or anything so far? Everyone's still awake, all right, cool. So the first thing we wanna do before we make any sales calls is build a sales process. How many people have a sales process that they work through, that they know exactly the steps that they follow? So for those of you that don't, and there may be some words that need to be edited out on here. This is our sales process. So we use the, the GE uh, six, six, six Sigma methodology when we built our uh, sales process. So the boxes are things you do and the diamonds are decisions and then down below those are the actual systems we use. <laughs> Evidently I'm my own system. Um, so as you go along left to right, things go across. So we understand, is this the first time we've talked to somebody? And if I could see this here. Uh, as it goes across, there are different decisions. Where are we at in the process? So part of understanding your sales process is trying to understand what's the goal of the call that you're on. So we have a rule in our company that we never sell, send a price quote or talk price to someone until we have a demo with that person. We might give them a ballpark, right? We're not, our software isn't hundreds of thousands of dollars, it might be tens of thousands of dollars. But I'm not gonna send you a price quote unless we've done that demo. So when we hire a new salesperson, it's very important that they know in what con which conversation are you having with a prospect. Is this the first contact you're having? So when you pick up the phone, what's your goal of that conversation? Is your goal of the conversation to get somebody to call you back? Is the goal of the conversation to introduce yourself, a product, the company? What's the point of every single call that you make? And if you can't figure out what the point of that call is, then don't make it, because all you're doing is wasting someone's time. And then you become that guy. I have a couple people that call me all the time that are that guy, that they want to set up a meeting for next week, just 10 minutes to catch up. Why? What are we going to talk about? Tell me what we're going to talk about. So before you pick up the phone and call anybody, understand why you're calling them. But the sales process and sitting down, not only with your uh, salespeople, but with everyone in your organization so they understand what the process is. When do we show quotes? When do we do a demo? When does it make sense to follow up? And how frequently do we follow up? So we have all sorts of, of different processes here and the people that pick those up. And then if we flip over to this other, we have a communication plan with how we communicate and the frequency with which we communicate with our prospects. So if they're a new prospect or if they're a customer, how frequently and if they start to be pushed off. So if you make an initial, if we do a demo and then that kind of dies off, do we pick that back up in 90 days? Do we pick it up in 180 days in a year? How frequently do we try to, uh, to bring that lead back to life? So we went through a very specific process to build our sales process, but that better enables us to approach each call. So I have a goal for each call contact with the prospect. And you have to be realistic about each call that you make with your prospects, right? You're not gonna try to make, I mean, how many people try, think that it's gonna take one call to make a sale? Does anybody have a business where that works? You do, can you describe how that works? Um, well, we sell ticketing services, so um, I just actually did a really big sale a couple of weeks ago and closed it in 24 hours. I sent an email, I just, I, I hit the guy right at the right time, he was just about ready to make a decision on it. He called me, I gave him a demo, he said I like it. Is that an exception or is that? Um, it's either or. You either do deals like that or it takes us like six years. <laughs> right, <laughs> sure. But, but for you, you have to be able to prepare to execute that quickly that if somebody says, yeah, I like this, let's do a demo that you can pick up and say it doesn't take you, oh wait, I need three weeks to prepare for that, that you have to be able to respond to that request, right? where other people, you might have to build a whole new virtual machine or something else to do a demo, or you might have to build a whole other, get other people involved, like a technical sales support person. So again, it's understanding your process that can you go through and say, react that quickly to a prospect? Because if you didn't, and he was ready to make a decision, he may have gone and you may have lost the sale, right? Your ability to do that saved the deal. So you can add that in there as well. So how, long, how many calls on average do you think it takes to make a sale? Anybody have any idea in their business? Eight. Eight? 
That's pretty good that you knew that right out. Shit, do I have stuff to throw to people? <laughs> I could get out some of the brownies and throw them to people. I should have brought koozies. Damn. Come to our office and get a koozie, play some pool. Someone stole the Xbox. Eight, anybody else? More or less than eight? Average? At least, most of the time it at least takes five. Five calls to get somebody to really pay attention to you, right? So having an expectation that you're gonna make one call and have a sale you know, is probably a little bit unrealistic, but at the same time, you need to understand who your prospects are. So can, can anybody share? Yeah, go ahead. So the, the, the question is, is how do you identify what the customer's needs are? Is that a fair way to summarize? So how do you approach that? Well, that would be the goal of one of your calls is to basically say, let's have a discovery call. And so can we walk through my goal? And you can tell that to your prospect and say, I want to have a discovery call where we can walk through your challenges and understand what your needs may be so we can start to focus our conversations around your business problems and not around our solutions. I tell, our, I tell our salespeople all the time, people don't care about our products, they care about their problems. And they, eventually they'll care about how we can solve their problems. Like we all, we, we have, how many people have names for their products, right? I, we have all these fancy names for our products, no one cares. Internally, we have to have names to our products, right? Because we have to say, well, this is the product we're building, but nobody calls us up and says, we want a sure. Somebody calls up and says, we need a segregation of duty solution. But we have about five different products. So the, to, to identify, to set a goal to say, we need to understand what your challenges are so we can focus the rest of our conversations and better utilize our time together. Because I don't want to waste your time going through an overview demo of our software if all you need is this one piece of it, right? I don't want to have to go through five different pieces of software. So being open and honest with a prospect is great. You know, they want to be efficient, you want to be efficient, because the other thing you want to do is you want to close and move on to the next one, right? You don't want to spend any longer with a prospect than you have to either. Whether it, it's, it's always the thing where it's funny when you come to Iowa, is that everybody's so nice. It was the biggest change that I had when I came back to Iowa, was that if you go do business on the East Coast or in Chicago, if you call somebody up and they don't want your stuff, they hang up on you immediately. In Iowa, everybody's nice. Oh, come do a demo. We'll buy you a sandwich. And, you'll, and they have no intention of ever buying whatever you're selling, but they don't want to be mean to you, right? It's like when, people, when telemarketers call, they, they would rather have you hang up on them because they want to sell something, right? So it's the same thing. So if you can explain to them the reason for this call is discovery, understanding if this is a good fit. And if it's not a good fit, well, I want to move on because there's nothing worse than a bad sale. There's nothing worse than somebody buying your product that doesn't need your product. And I would say that to them. I do say that to, the, to, to our prospects. Hey, if this isn't a good fit, that's fine. I want it to solve your problems and have a happy customer. I don't want to sell you something you don't need. So, but that would be a goal for one of your calls early on in the process. Discovery, I think that's, is that a pretty typical term in your, your industry? Uh, in the uh, legal world it is, in sales it is, yeah. yeah. I mean, do other people have other terms for that besides discovery that you might? It is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that could be the goal of a goal of a session is to better understand the needs, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, as I said, to tell the person why you want to talk to them. So one of the things is, so you have the goal. You also need to understand who you need on that call. So the more you can learn at the beginning of the sales process, the better in understanding their inner workings. So do you need, and that can be both from the prospect side, who are the internal people that you need from the prospect? Do they have a relationship with somebody else that's gonna help? Are they working with a consulting firm? Are they working with some other provider that has a say in this decision? Is there another influencer, like for us, their audit firm? Someone else along the process that's gonna impact that decision you also need to understand who you need from your side on the call. Do you need a technical person? Do you need a salesperson? Is this a meeting where you have to have one of your executives on the call just to show that they're sup this client is super important? Or is it just a call between your main point of contact? So understand who you need on that call every time and making sure that you have the right people on those calls. Because all that's gonna end up doing, it's, you can do your best to do that. It doesn't always happen. What it does for us is we just end up 
iterating through demo cycles and sales cycles. So you do a demo for the audit team, you do a demo for the IT team, you do a demo for the, you know, the audit board, whatever it may be, instead of trying to get all those people into one place. How many people have call scripts that you work from when you make calls? A couple. How many people know what a call script is? Yeah, how many, why are there so many salespeople in here that don't have call scripts? Are you guys just that good at what, did you ever start with a call script? Are you guys just that, you do? Okay, so that would, that would be, that would be one of the first thing I would do is go through and build call scripts and understand for each part of your process, understand what your general script is gonna be for that call. How many people have software that they demo? A couple, I know, I know a couple people do back here. So from a software, how many people have a software demo that you walk through, that a script for that, your typical walkthrough? And the reason I put fluid there is being able to adjust to each one of your clients and understanding what their requirements are, what their needs are. So if you're building a demo, like if, if we have somebody that comes to us and says, Heineken, Heineken's inventory is very valuable to me, um, but a lot of their auditing is based around their inventory, right? They wanna have controls around their inventory. Who can walk out of the warehouse with a case of beer? Well, so I wanna focus my demo around inventory. But if somebody else calls and says, we have payroll and that's all we need to audit, I don't want to go out and have a demo that's built around a case of beer. Well, maybe I do. <laughs> I don't want to build a demo around inventory when they're concerned about who's looking at their HR master data and who changed their benefits and their address and that information. So you have to build the call scripts and the demo scripts, but build them in a way that eventually you can target their needs better. So back to the discovery that you can, you can build those, those scripts. Uh, the last thing, and this will try to probably make you seem crazy at the office, is practice. Practice your calls, practice your demos, call your voicemail and see what you sound like. Call your coworkers, call your parents, your friends. You know, this is the same thing as speech class when you're in high school, go do it in front of a mirror. I shouldn't have my hands in my pockets right now, but that's just the way it is today. So, you know, when you're, when you're doing presentations and when you're, when you're doing that kind of thing, when you're live in front of an audience, you get energy from the audience, right? And you're walking around, you're moving around. When you're sitting at your desk doing a demo or a call, if you're slouched over your desk and you're just kind of laid back, wearing your hat on backwards, people can hear that. Stand up when you make calls. Walk around when you make calls. You know, go somewhere else to do the calls. Do different things. But if you practice that, you'll be amazed and embarrassed as to what you sound like, not just when you hear your recording of your own voice, but how your calls come off to different people. And the more you can make that organic and make it sound less like you're reading from a script, the better off you're gonna be. Because the worst case scenario sometimes is you have this script all planned and more, nine times out of 10 you get people's voicemail and then, oh, holy crap, they answered the phone. Oh no, what am I gonna do? <laughs> like, I've totally lost it because I, I had this script, I had it memorized. So again, the more you practice it and the more fluid it becomes, the easier. It's the same thing as you know a football player. The more times you practice a play and the more you get used to it, you're just gonna be able to react to it and not have to think through what you're doing. So that's also hard for a lot of people, especially in small businesses. I'm not a sales, I, I'm a person that I can sell, I'm not a salesperson, right? We have salespeople at our office. I can sell, but I'm not a professional salesperson. So I can build the process, but it's being able to become a professional salesperson is being able to do all those things without thinking about it and making it seem like that. But if you're at a small company where you might be the only person and, the, and you're the CIO, the CFO, the VP of sales and the janitor and everything else, you have to become a little bit proficient at that and not make it sound like you have no idea what you're doing, even when you don't. Any questions on the lay the groundwork and please go ahead and make it long so I can take a drink. Yeah, so the question was, is how do you identify, how do you identify who the key people are for each sales call? And some of that is just knowing your business and over time, the more time you spend, and a lot of times you'll be wrong. That you'll think that, you know, for your business, so I need to call the box office manager, I need to call, you know, the talent person from this bar, from this venue, and all along you needed to call the owner. 
that the owner is really the one that controls everything and you know that person can like you but the one that holds the purse strings is somebody else a lot of it is just pay attention now and, and document a lot of those things of where you've had the success so get a CRM system document where you're having the success and then you'll start to build that knowledge. I know that's kind of a crummy answer, but sometimes you just, for us, I wanna look for the director of auditing. I wanna look for the director of IT. I wanna get both of those people in the same room at the same time, if possible. So you have goals of who you want, and then over time, those will start to take shape, and then you can start to analyze that data after the fact. You know, you can also go to other, you know, you can look at other, uh, industries of who they're targeting who's responsive sometimes the best you know who do i want to talk to on a call somebody that will respond <laughs> you know because the best thing you can do is find somebody to carry your message back to those other people because if you're looking for the owner of a venue the odds are that person is never going to get on a call with you so you have to find you know the person that cuts his hair what or whatever it may be that can get to their ear so anybody else else have ideas around how to identify who you want on a call or how anyone does that. See, when you don't throw away free stuff, here, Mike's going to throw his brownie to somebody to answer the question. I was gonna eat the oh, you're going to eat the brownie. Sorry. Any other questions? Did that answer your question? So that was my old consulting self saying it depends. So prepare. Uh, familiarize yourself with the client before the call. This is the easiest thing you can do that people don't do. There's so much information out there with LinkedIn. Does everyone know what LinkedIn is? I mean, this is so much easier than it was just five years ago. It's all out there. Google is your friend. One of the things that people miss a lot is where is the company located? And understand, if they're in Green Bay, I bet they're Packers fans. Now, a lot of, I like sports, so a lot of what I talk about with people are sports. But this goes back to, you know, my dad was, uh, is, was a salesperson, and he always told me to read the newspaper. Read the newspaper, find out what's going on in the world so that you can talk to somebody about something other than your product. You don't want to waste their time, but when you're sitting around at the beginning of a demo or something and just kind of shooting the breeze, you want to understand, already, where, does anybody know where I went to college? Does anybody Right, see? It's just little things like that where now all of a sudden it's like, oh, I kind of know him a little more. It's not a trick, it's just you're trying to get to understand people better. So understanding where they're located. We just had a demo get canceled because of the hurricane, right? So you ask them, how's it going? How long were the lights out? Because you're genuinely interested. But if you just walk into a sales call and you're more concerned about you selling a product or your products and not their problems and not their business, you're, you're much better off engaging with someone in that way. The other thing is understanding what do they do, right? So auditing is ubiquitous. It doesn't matter. I'm testing to see if the controls are in place in your business, but whether you're Heineken or Dell or GoDaddy or any one of our clients, they, they all have pretty different businesses, right? So they, their needs from us are similar, but I want to understand what they do as a company. This is the worst part about having to sell remotely is I don't get to go on factory tours anymore. It's, that was my favorite part is going on site, getting to see things. You get to, even the most boring cube farm could just be, hey, it was somebody else's cubicle farm, right? It's not mine, it's interesting, right? So it's, it's understanding the company because you don't get a chance to go stand in front of them and have your personality. You don't get to wear a crazy tie. You don't get to come in and shake hands and ask where the bathroom is or get to go on the tour and all those other things that you get to do to, to really get to know the other person and, and try to build a relationship beyond, I have lemonade for five cents a glass, you want some? You want to find out why are they thirsty, how, where do they have, well, if you live in Alaska, my lemonade might freeze when I ship it there. That kind of information. Um, also, you can look at their website, probably has a lot of information about have they had any recent successes, any changes at the company, any other news that talking, if you're trying to sell to Musco, that they just won the award for lighting the Statue of Liberty and how cool that was and talking about that information versus why you're your product is so perfect for Musco. Or if you're trying to sell a ticketing system for a venue, you might want to know that the Foo Fighters were just there to play their last concert or something interesting along those lines besides I've got some IT for you that's going to help your life uh, make that easier. 
You also want to so familiarize yourself with the company and then make sure that you also understand the individuals. So understand what the role is and you might want to talk to them about just because somebody says they're the director of IT, well, what is, okay, I'm the vice president. There are companies in this town that hand out vice presidencies to just anybody that comes through the door. What does that mean at your organization? Does that mean there are two vice presidents, there's one, there's 10 directors, there's one? So understand what those roles mean and you can ask. You know, what does that mean, you know, director, so what is your day-to-day -day role? What do you do on a daily basis at your company? Understand their role in the sales process. Well, my role is just making sure this isn't gonna blow up this other system. My role is to make sure that our end users are gonna be able to use it. My role is that I had nothing else to do today, so they just told me to come in here and watch the demo. You get a lot of that too. So uh, understanding those two things, and again, maybe they've worked at a client where they own, I've had that, where I went out and looked at LinkedIn before a demo and realized that somebody that was gonna be on the call used to work at a company that owns our software. Were they happy with our software? Yeah, ooh, now I've got an ally. Hey, they may not have offered that up during the meeting, and I'm not gonna potentially not bring that up during the meeting, but you wanna understand that they know that. And then understand the background of the people. So again, hey, I might go out and find out that there was some guy that went to Notre Dame, or there's some other guy that went to USC and I'd hang up on him. But you know, there's, there's information that you can determine about those people. So uh, one of, everybody know what Batteries Plus is? They sell batteries, it's not just a clever name, right? So I'm doing a demo for Batteries Plus, and it comes up that I went to, we were talking, one of the guys went to Marquette, and a buddy of mine from high school uh, went to Marquette. It turns out he was roommates with a guy from Marquette that I knew, he went to Dowling, I went to Valley, they went to Marquette together, and then it turns out that it, they had seen our band, I was in a band in college, they'd come to see our band play in college. All of a sudden, he could care less about what our software did, right? No. There, there's, it was all of a sudden, it was just making idle conversation at the beginning, suddenly we knew each other, and he was in Milwaukee, and I had no idea who he was. And so all of a sudden, Dan and I now, just through business, and it came all the way back around through that. So again, understanding who's on the call, understanding what they do, and then understanding the role in the sales process. And again, don't be afraid to ask. So many salespeople are just afraid to say, what's your role in the sales process? Or to say to companies, what is your purchasing process? Who are the decision makers? Say it, ask it. Don't let it be a mystery. I get frustrated with our salespeople all the time when I say, well, what's their purchasing cycle like? Their what? <laughs> like, are they gonna buy this year? Do they have a budget? Those types of questions. You wanna ask those types of things. Don't be afraid to ask. And the worst thing that I can tell you is nothing and you're no worse off than you were before. And then understand the client requirements before the call. So this is very much pointed at doing a demo of software because that's what I do all the time. Um, is under, it's, you're much better off doing a solution demo versus doing an overview of your products. And that goes back to the Heineken with their inventory versus a company with needs for their HR. Because if you can walk them through a day in their life using your tools, instead of just overviewing all the great things that your tools can do. If, a, if, I'm a car, if I'm a truck salesman and somebody comes in and says, all I care about and the only time I'm ever gonna drive this truck is when I'm towing my boat to Okoboji. That's the only time. I care less about anything else. I don't wanna have a car salesman tell me, or as the truck salesman, I'm not gonna tell them, oh, it's got heated seats, and oh, you can put a blade on the front of this, and I don't care about any of that other stuff. Does it, show me how it tows, does it work? This is my boat, will it work with that? Focus in on those key requirements before anything else. So many people, when they do software demos, they fall in love with their products. And your prospects don't care about your products, they care about their problems. They wanna fix their problems. So you, you can get off track and waste 10, 20, an entire demo focusing on something else. So the more you can understand about the requirements, which goes back to saying, doing the discovery to try to figure out the, what those requirements are. And the way that I say it, a lot of people will push back. A lot of prospects will push back and say, you know, what are your requirements? Oh, we just wanna see what you guys can do to help us. Oh, we just kinda wanna see what you guys can do. We've heard a lot of good things about you. What specifically can we help you with because we don't wanna waste your time. We wanna make this work as efficiently for everyone as possible. 
So you will get <coughs> occasionally get pushback from people on that, but more often than not, people are pretty forthcoming. I mean, how, do a lot of people get RFPs? Some. I mean, it's a luxury to get an RFP where they'll tell you, I want it to, my truck to be black, and I want it to tow my boat, and it has to have a sunroof. And other people just wander onto the car lot and go, I need four wheels. It's like, well, I don't even know where to start. You give me more information. Because I may have the perfect vehicle for you. I just, trying to draw that out of people can be difficult. So that's how to prepare just from a business side, is that, again, have a goal for every call and make sure each call is driving towards something. Again, if you can't figure out why you're picking up the phone to call somebody or launching a session to be online with them, you shouldn't be doing it. Any questions on the prepare side while I take a drink? Is this, making, is this working for everybody? Let's see, stop, ask a question. So prepare the technology. How many people do shared sessions or remote sessions for demos? couple. So the first thing you want to do if you're going to do a software demo or do any sort of online sharing of anything is you want to make sure that your technology is ready to go. So make sure that all your virtual machines, all your servers, all your technology works. Make sure your software works. Make sure that you have, you didn't forget your charger for your laptop. Make sure you didn't, you know, about three months ago when I was came down here to do the session, I was going to rely on doing it online. I was using a new tool, something I'd never used before, and I was required to have internet access. And Mike and I battled the internet access long enough that I finally just gave up. Uh-oh. But for a minute, I was very like, oh, uh, insert favorite word here. Like, this is going to be a problem. So you got to make sure that you may not want to rely on something. If you have a big prospect and a huge deal, don't try something new the very first time, right? So make sure everything works. If you have to rely on a VPN, make sure that you can connect. There are hotels in the world, if you're doing a demo from a hotel, that won't allow you onto a VPN. There are hotels in the world where they only have Wi-Fi. Do you have a backup plan? So you know, a lot of times for us, hey, customer, want, if I'm on the road speaking and somebody wants a demo, our salespeople say, this person wants a demo tomorrow, I'm gonna try to do that from my hotel room, but I better make sure before we agree to that that it'll actually work. So you wanna make sure that all the tech net technology uh, is ready. Um, the other thing you wanna do is have a contingency plan. So fortunately, I had brought a backup of my presentation and Mike and I got it figured out but you only get one chance to make a first impression, right? If you screw it up and you're the technical salesperson, right? That other salesperson is going to break your legs <laughs> for, or somebody else at your organization is going to be very upset that all you had to do is make sure that you brought your power cord and you forgot it, that the light bulb burned out somewhere else or that the power was out someplace. So actually last Sunday night when I was doing a demo, GoToMeeting was doing an upgrade. Citrix was doing an upgrade. <laughs> I had no idea that was going to happen, but they were like, well, who does demos at 7 o'clock at night central time? We figured that would be a downtime. So we had a little bit of an issue, and we had to wait a little bit, and I had a contingency plan for that. So again, make sure that you don't have, you basically, instead of one chance to make a first impress, impression, you get one chance to screw it up. Because most of the time, you're not going to get a second chance to screw it up, right? The next thing is choose a platform. Um, there are a lot of different options out there in terms of technology. You go to meeting, WebEx, Microsoft has a tool. There are all these smaller, you know, exam what are some of the things people use to do their screen sharing? Any other? Say again? Join me. Skype. Skype. Yep. My only recommendation is it doesn't matter, but you don't want to pick. There are a lot of companies, like Join Me is kind of new, it, it, but it works pretty well. But there are a lot of other small startups that do that. You have to remember that just because it, it has to work on both sides of the world. It has to work for you, and it has to work for the company that you're demoing to. And if it's some small piece of technology that no one's ever heard of, they might have a rule on their network that doesn't allow them to download software. They might have a rule on their network that, where they can't install software or use it. So as much as it's fun to support smaller companies and those types of things, I wouldn't leave that up to. We use GoToMeeting a lot because it works pretty well internationally. We've seen issues with some of the other ones. I'm not going to endorse any one versus 
other ones. Skype is fantastic. Um, you also want to make sure that as you do uh, have a teleconference option. So we do a lot of demos in Africa. So they barely have the bandwidth to do the demo, let alone VoIP. So you have to have a teleconference number that will work. The other thing you want to do is make sure if you are doing international sales and you're going to use your cell phone, that you understand how to dial internationally from your cell phone or how, from the hotel or from your home phone or from any phone, how to get to that. Because a lot of times, those companies will dictate to you the platform you're going to use instead of you dictating to them. But choose something, test it, and then the biggest thing is you better be prepared to troubleshoot it. Because when they can't make it work on their side of the world, you have to be able to, I'm just, when I launch it, it says can't connect, what do I do? You have to be able to walk them through that and try to do that. So the more proficient you can become with the tools on your side, or if you know right off the top of your head what the Citrix support number is or what the Skype support number is, is that they're going to have an expectation. And even though that's a problem with WebEx or whatever else, it looks bad for you. It wasn't your fault. It's that technology. It's not your technology, but that reflects on you. And so you want to make sure that you're comfortable with it. Again, all of this is practice. Practice, practice, practice. Even if you don't... If, Skype, if you're going to use Skype, that's fantastic. I would encourage you to use it for a ton of different things. If you're going to pick up the phone and call, you know, Casey's to order pizza, pizza, use Skype. So you get more used to using it and you get more comfortable with the controls in it. And that's going to help you so you don't end up falling down. Because to me, this is, as Mike said, sales are the most important part of the business, right? To a lot of, to a lot of degree. If you don't sell anything, it doesn't matter what else you do. So execute. So be on time or early if possible. Right now, people aren't used to the fact that when you have an online meeting or an online call, that there's all, it always takes five minutes longer. They think they can show up at 10 o'clock. And it, they, sh they show up and it's like, oh, wait, I'm waiting for go to meeting to launch. And oh, we forgot to set up the projector or we forgot to do other things. If you're early, it gives them some ability to log in early. If you launch the session right at the time it's supposed to start, you're immediately make to eating up some of the time that you could use on that session. It'd be the same thing as if you were, I approach online meetings the same way I would if I was coming on site to one of your businesses to present. Be on time, be punctual. But it gives them an opportunity to kind of mitigate the risk of it going over, over time. Uh, humanize the session, and what I mean by this is back to the know where they went to school, know what their business d does, understand what's going on, and there are times where, I'm, I know that Mike's taping this, so hopefully all of our prospects don't watch this. There are times where I accidentally share my screen, and I might have a picture of my son, or I might have a picture of, does anybody know what that picture was on the front? Like a picture of this? And I don't intend to, like, well, I, I kind of accidentally, intentionally share that. That's a Jack Daniels warehouse where they make the, uh, where the barrels of whiskey sit while they age. But it's a talking point, right? So what you're trying to do is make it personal. When you're on site, you get to shake hands. You get to understand, are people paying attention? I mean, the two guys that are sleeping in back and the three people up here on their iPhones not paying attention, you can't see that. So if you talk to them and you get to, uh, they can kind of know who you are and it's less about the product and a little bit more about making that personal connection, do that. One of the ways to do that is you do introductions. Go around your virtual room, Find out who's in the room. Find out what's their name, what do they do, and ask them, what do you hope to see today? Why are you here? I'm just hoping that it doesn't light the building on fire, whatever it may be. And that, again, helps you build some of the requirements. Uh, you also want to take notes and incorporate their names into the demos. So, like for our software, I use all Simpsons characters. I used to use all Chicago Cubs names, but when you start going international, people don't know the Chicago Cubs, so I use all Simpsons characters. But where I can, instead of saying Homer, the AP clerk, if Jenny, the AP clerk, is on their side in the demo, well, why not say Jenny, the AP clerk, instead of Homer, the AP clerk? Because now if she's sitting in the demo with her head in the iPhone, when she hears her name, all of a sudden she wakes up and she starts paying attention a little more. People like to hear their own name. So if you can use that, it helps. Uh, drive an interactive discussion. Don't fall in love with the sound of your own voice, which this is my biggest problem. 
is that my is I can just demo our software till no end. Make it a conversation, and it's hard to do remotely. And the best way to do that is stop frequently and ask questions. Ask for audience participation. How many people have raised their hands so far today, right? To make sure people are paying attention, right? And then also make sure that when you do a solution demo, it doesn't turn into technical training. You're not walking them through and saying, when I push this button, it sends it to a PDF, and then click on the button and watch it open, and they get it. You can export to different, they don't, you don't have to walk them through each little thing. What you want to do is focus on, we can export and touch on high level things, and then ask them frequently, is this what you were hoping to see? Does this look like it'll solve your problem? How are you currently doing this in your organization? Are there better ways to do this? Have you looked at any other solutions? And if you constantly ask those questions and drive that, it turns it less into you talk. I mean, if you're not gonna ask questions, why not just post a demo out online and forget it? You know, or just post, here's all the detail, your website should do all the selling for you. There's no point in interaction. So as my wife likes to point out to me, is you have two ears and one mouth for a reason, you should do more listening than talking, right? So it's, it's, you should ask more questions, let them guide you because their problems are gonna sell your products, not your products, um, unless you know, they're that good, but that's gonna help you a lot. So the other thing that I see a challenge with a lot of people that do any sort of calling, slow down. You know what you're talking about. They don't, this is the first time they've ever seen it. I've already done 15 demos this week and I have two more this afternoon. I can get going pretty fast and do a lot of repetition. And I, as you notice, I can talk fast, right? So the issue is go slow. It's the first time they've walked through your product, your application. You have to assume they know their business process, they know the challenge, but they don't know your software. And then the most important thing is leave time to understand. So what are the next steps in the process? Now that you've seen this, who else do you need to talk to? Who should I be talking to? Where does the process go from here? And then wrap, wrap that up. So if you can do those things inside of every call, I know I talked a little bit about demos, but that's how we work, is, but in, in, any sales call should be the same way. And if you can take that approach to it, and if you notice everything that we do in our company, we take the methodology of plan, 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 execute, Plan, 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 plan. Everything's planning, and then by the time you get to the execution part, you should be well prepared. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that difficult if, you, if you've practiced it and you understand that. The other thing I'll say about demos, can I swear, Mike? Shit, shit happens. It's gonna, no matter how well prepared you are, it's gonna happen, it's gonna go bad, the lights are gonna go off, somebody is gonna dig through the internet cable, something bad's gonna happen, the software's gonna blow up, and all you have to do to handle that is say, ah, it has to happen once a demo, doesn't it? And you just move on. People understand their issues. Don't panic, don't, it's just move on, just keep going, restart it, ask them for patience. People understand those types of things. And the people that don't, do you want them as clients anyway? Probably not. No, that's not true. They're, uh, so it's gonna happen. I think we have, we have when, when we first train people to do demos at our company, they freak out anytime anything bad happens. Just slow down, just let the bad stuff go away, make light of it, and kind of move on. So, any qu so leave time for next steps and wrap up. So, I'll follow my own rules. Anybody have any questions about, or ideas, or things I didn't talk about? Yeah, go ahead. So, in, in your industry, there are a couple of things I'm in your shop. Yeah, sure. Um, so, the first question was how do we approach competition, right? Is that a decent way to summarize that? We don't have any competition <laughs> in our market, so that makes it easier, but back when I worked at organizations where we had a lot of competition, um, you know, when you'd go through those, we'd go through RFP processes and have to go sit on site, and you'd be sitting in a line, and there'd be your competition sitting like right next to you in the same gray suit with the same bad red tie that you have on, and they're waiting to go in right after you. How do you address the competition? My philosophy has is, is, is always been, I don't address the competition unless somebody specifically asks, how do you compare to them? And then I always focus on how we can meet the business challenges, how we do things, the strengths of our company versus anything else. 
because frankly, I don't know how the other companies, I mean, I might have a lot of research and those types of things, but it's we can do it, this is how we do it, this is why we think it's the best, and these are some of the advantages of working with, with our organization and try to build that and not sell against somebody as much as highlight why you're better at doing that. Anybody else have other ideas of how you sell against competition? Or either that or have nude photos of people. Either, either way is fine. There's, there, anybody have any other ideas? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that can help. I mean, if they do have other features that you don't have that's, that are a requirement, the, the one thing you don't want to get into, service is a great thing. The other thing you can get, don't want to get into is talking about their products because as far as you know, it changed. Or if somebody asks you specifically that I saw that this product emails Santa Claus on an hourly basis and yours doesn't, you might want to start to talk about, well, we didn't really know that that was a requirement or is that a requirement or you can start to talk around that, but I wouldn't start talking about features that they, and functionality that they have because it could have changed. They may know more about it, so you're better off focusing on yourself and those types of things. And if you have a, an area of strength, obviously focus on those during the, the demos. You can also set landmines for the other guys, right? Where you say, focus on things that you know that, that you do that they don't do to set those up so when they come in that they have to answer those questions. The second question, if I recall, is what are some of the closing, what are some of the reasons people buy our software? Most of the people that buy our software, um, it's because they gain efficiencies, they can mitigate their risk in their organization, so a lot of what they do is manual. So it's, they sit there with three ring binders and mass quantities of paper and try to figure out who has access to what, who has access to price a case of beer, who has access to go leave with a case of beer, those types of things. You have to sit through a report and manually flip through those pages. Our, our tools will automate all that. So a lot of that comes down to taking some, and then we have methodologies that we've built that really simplify auditing. Auditing has always kind of been this ethereal, you should be doing it, well how do I do it, there's no guide to it. So we have a lot of templates, a lot of those types of things that start to draw heavier black lines for people internally that they've never had before. And our, our focus is really on the mid-market, so a lot of our customers don't have internal auditors so they're saying, if you can bring some of that knowledge with your software, now I kind of have internal auditor in a box where I used to be the you know, controller, the CFO, and it was all on me. So we can start to automate that way. Um, so there's cost savings involved. Other times people buy our software because the auditor told them that they should have an automated solution, so they come to us and buy software. And other times, I mean, the, the biggest thing is to automate a very manual, tedious, expensive process, so it's just the age-old software versus manual conversation. As, as far as the, and we have ROIs versus doing it manually, and we have a lot of those documents that we give to people, white papers, case studies from audit firms, other places that help guide them, but that's typically why, I mean, we have people, the biggest complaint we get about our software is where were you guys last quarter? Because it makes it so much easier than having to push around three ring binders in a shopping cart. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mark, and then I'll come back to you. What, if anything, in the way of contact precedes the call? Is that an email, a letter for the call? It depends on how we got the lead. I mean, most of the leads that we have, it's not like we're just throwing somebody the phone book and they're flipping through pages. We have a very specific segmented market, so we do a lot of research beforehand. So, you know, in Iowa, there aren't that many publicly traded companies to begin with, let alone publicly traded companies that use, say, a Microsoft product. So if we, if we can figure that out and we do a lot of that research, sometimes a phone call is the first thing. If, you're, if your first contact's gonna be to an auditor, the phone is better. If your first contact's gonna be to an IT person, what do you think works better? Email, right? So some of it depends, but again, it's where that lead came from and some of the research that you do up front. And I don't think it really makes any difference which tact you take, whether it's a letter, whatever it may be, but it's just picking one and then staying consistent with it or then changing that over time. And just some of this is, so much of sales and marketing is art versus science and what, what's working today. Because what's funny is these, like everybody moved away from sending physical mail to people, right? Well, now if you send physical mail to somebody, like the whole office goes crazy because, look, I got a piece of mail. Like no one gets mail anymore. Now all of a sudden they look at that, it's, all, it's come full circle back. So 
some of it depends. We've seen a lot of marketing people encouraging us to write handwritten letters to people because it's effective, because they'll read those. So I don't know if that answers your question. And Dave, I failed for repeating the question. I'll try next time. So the question is, is how do you kind of get a read, uh, take the temperature of your prospect as to whether things are going well or not? Is that a fair way to phrase that? Ask. The best thing you can do is ask. I mean, I've, had, I've walked out of demos and gone, Dude, if that person even ever calls us back, that was the worst demo I've ever done in my life. I wish I could start over and we get a PO the next day. I've come out of demos feeling like I'm going to go golfing with these guys and they're going to be you know, the godfather to our parent. Like, like, this is going to be the greatest thing in the world. Never hear back from them. So you can ask people. The best thing you can do, and I think the one thing people are hesitant to do, is ask. Is to say, how does this, just back to the question, is to say, does this look like this would meet your needs? Yes. And that's all you can really do. But it's also trying to get them to interact on the session because you can get, if if you hear things in the background or they, they're taking a long time to answer, sometimes you can get a vibe. But don't let that stop you or discourage you. Don't let that interaction discourage you because they may have already decided that they were going to buy your product before you even started the demo. They only wanted the demo just to make sure that you were real people, that it wasn't you know, vaporware or something, right? That, that all they wanted to know was that. And if I can confirm that, then I'm good. So th they might be like, yeah, great, thanks. Cool, great, bye. And you're like, huh, oh, you know, but she might really like you and she, you know, you should keep calling her because you might get that second date or whatever. So um, that's typically how I do it. But a lot of times that's where you can end up falling in love with the sound of your own voice or your product and forget to ask those questions and build that into your demo scripts or build that into your sales call to say, how is your dinner? Do you like, how's your steak? You know, it's not just sitting there and just eating your dinner fast and then leaving. It's asking them those questions to regard that. But that's the, the hardest thing is, as far as you know, they've gone to sleep, they've left the room, they're doing something else. You just have no idea. So all you can do is, is ask. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it makes sense to do some of the, those types of things. But again, I think it's the interaction and showing your personality can even add more to that. I mean, we encourage all of our people to have, you know, LinkedIn profiles, that kind of information out there. We don't do, we're, we don't recreate all that stuff out on the web because we figure if somebody's that interested, they're smart enough to go find it. Um, it's not a bad idea, but to me, there's no substitute for having a person, I mean, I, I demo the most boring thing you can think of, right? Auditing software. Can anybody think of something more boring than auditing software? There might be a few things. But to have a personality and to joke about it and to have fun and build stupid jokes, I mean, I, our salespeople have heard that Antarctica joke 12 times today. But people laugh, you guys laughed at it, right? People laugh at it. So it's having a personality and not just reading stereo instructions to people and making them feel like they know you because you do build a personal relationship with people when you go through a sales process with them, hopefully, if you're doing it right. So I think some of that stuff can be good, but I mean, it can't hurt. But to me, it's more of the interaction on the call to make sure that, because I've sat through software demos that are just like watching paint dry. I mean, I, and it's, it's, I, I just immediately stop paying attention even if it's something we need. So it's having that finding somebody, and, and also in your organization, find somebody that's good at it. I mean, they don't have to be slapstick joker like I am, but th you might find somebody that's really good at it that you had no expectation that they'd be good at it. You know, and other people, your best salespeople can be the worst software presenters because they just have no idea where to go or how somebody would use a tool. And your developers are typically horrible. They're awful because they, it's their kids. You know, if you want to see a picture of a three and a half year old, I have one at home and I have 10 pictures. I'm, the, I'm a proud dad. Developers are the same way. Ooh, they love their products. You know, I built this feature over here. Let's talk about it. It has nothing to do with what the customer wants. So they'll just focus in on that or talk too much about the technology. So it's one o'clock. Any other questions? Does everybody get to go home now? It's the holiday, right? Go home and clean behind the water heater at least. <laughs>
I do. I have two coming up. One, one's in Newfoundland. I'm very excited. Atlantic time. All right. Well, thank you very much.